I've been using the HP Envy X2 for the past three weeks as my daily driver. As you know, I unboxed it. I was curious to see how the Windows 10 would perform on a Snapdragon 835, in essence, a mobile processor and ARM processor. And I was a little bit surprised by some things, disappointed in others. But overall, I have to say it's been a very interesting ride to say the least. Hey everybody, this is Andrew, and this is my review of the HP Envy X2. Let's find out if it's worth your money. If you haven't done so already, check out my unboxing and first impressions video of the HP NVX2. I go into a lot of detail there about some aspects that I won't cover in this video, so I encourage you to check it out. The idea of running Windows 10 OS on a mobile processor, an ARM processor such as the Snapdragon 835, has been an intriguing idea. And so I gave it a go as my daily driver for the past three weeks. And the end result is, well, it's a bit of a mixed bag. On one hand, it's pretty astonishing and pretty fascinating. On the other hand, it's a bit disappointing, especially when it comes to performance. Either way, it's a very interesting device with a lot of potential down the road. It just may not be ready right now. In this video, I'm going to concentrate on the pros and cons of the NVX2. Let's start off with one of its better aspects, its display. The first thing that hit me when I started using the NVX2 is how good this display is. You have a 12.3 inch IPS display with a resolution of 1920 by 1280. That's a 3 by 2 aspect ratio and I prefer a 3 by 2 aspect ratio, especially when it comes to 2 in 1s. This is probably one of the brightest displays out there, even better than the Surface Pro in the 2-in-1 category, better than the category average of 293, and better some of its competition, especially the Nova Go, which also runs a Snapdragon processor. Only the iPad Pro came in higher. It covers the color gamut really well at 121% sRGB, and it's better than the category average of 112%. Here you can see it against some of its competition, it held its own. The viewing angles are excellent, there's no screen bleed, the blacks are very deep, and I thought the colors were very vibrant, popping off the display, something I want to see on an excellent panel. And as I pointed out in my unboxing video, the bezels are on the thick side. And the reason being is because you're going to use this in tablet mode. But again, I want to see thinner bezels even on these two-in-ones. That's just my preference. But overall, this is an excellent display, probably one of its stronger suits. But without a doubt, its strongest suit is its epic battery life. This thing really is a battery monster. It took about 15 hours and 8 minutes of constant web surfing on Wi-Fi to drain the NVX2 of its charge. And it averages around 2 days between charges or 48 hours. And I think that's pretty good when I'm using it for what I call mixed use. This thing really is an endurance king. And here's how it did against its competition. It trounced the Surface Pro 2017. It beat out the Asus Nova Go, which also runs on an ARM processor. It beat out the Lenovo Mix 720 and outlasted the iPad Pro. It also outlasted the category average of eight hours and 46 minutes. Overall, this is a battery beast. And it charges really fast. I actually got a full charge from zero to 100% in about an hour and 45 minutes. That's actually pretty good. Now one of the benefits of running a Qualcomm Snapdragon 835 processor is the built-in LTE. In fact, it uses the Qualcomm X16 LTE modem. That's the modem you'd find on some high-end smartphones. Speeds are good, and it was actually giving me a little bit better battery life than when I was on Wi-Fi. That's actually pretty good. And if you need more storage, there is a micro SD card slot. Now you only get one USB-C port, it does data charge and display out. Unfortunately, no Thunderbolt 3 here, and that's it. You only get that one port. I wish it did have a few more ports, although you do get a micro SD card slot for storage expansion, and that's about it. Now when it comes to audio on the NVX2, I was impressed. Now I covered the sound test in my unboxing and first impressions video, so I encourage you to check it out. Suffice it to say, these are Bang & Olufsen branded speakers. There is a hint of bass, there is some volume to it that is actually pretty good. Overall, for a thin and light tablet, I was impressed. Now there is a 3.5 millimeter audio jack. It worked well, there was no interference or any static when I connected my headphones. Actually, it was pretty good. 
The keyboard cover attaches to the NVX2 using magnets and pins, so nothing too unusual here. However, as the stand is integrated into the cover rather than the tablet itself, there are a couple of more steps to get to the tablet setup in the cover than with a simpler Surface style kickstand that we saw with the Surface Pro. Having the stand attached to the keyboard also means you just can't prop up the tablet alone. If the stand was integrated into the tablet body, the NVX2 strengths as a media consumption device would be even stronger. Propping up the tablet, watching a video, enjoying that outstanding battery life is something you still can do, but you need to carry that case with you. But as you all need to bring this keyboard along with you to use the stand, this sort of experience is a bit diminished. Now the good news is the keyboard is actually pretty good. It has a great tactile feedback, the keys are decently sized for typing, and there's not a significant amount of flex in the cover while smashing out a Word document. And the good news is the keyboard's backlit. Unfortunately, it's only one level of backlighting, but nonetheless, the keys lit up pretty evenly, and it's pretty good when you're in a dimly lit environment. Now I thought the trackpad was okay as well considering it didn't have much space allocated to it. It's a wide trackpad which is typical of an HP device as of late. Now two finger scrolling worked okay and you can do your Windows 10 gestures. Overall responsiveness was good. Now when it comes to the HP Pen, they do include that at this price point, $999, so you don't have to buy it as a separate accessory as you would with the Surface Pro. Now having said that, it uses the N-Trick Pen technology the same as the Surface Pen. Unfortunately, it doesn't have quite as good pressure sensitivity. Here we only get 1,024 levels of pressure sensitivity as opposed to the new Surface Pen's 4,096, so it's not quite as good. Now I did notice a bit of lag. That's probably due to its weak processor. Overall, not the best. To jot down a note or two, or to take some notes in a classroom, you're probably fine, but digital artists who are serious about it will probably look at other devices. Now I covered the front-facing webcam in my unboxing video, and I thought it was actually pretty good at 1080p, 30 frames per second. Perfect for Skype, perfect for video conferencing when you need to use it. So definitely something that is actually pretty good. One of the better ones you'd get on a two-in-one. Unfortunately, things aren't so great when it comes to performance. The Snapdragon 835 is a low power processor with weak single core performance. So this level of performance isn't all that surprising. Looking at the benchmark results in native apps like Edge, you can expect performance above an Atom-based Celeron processor from Intel, but below most of Intel's core processors from the past three or four years. You're just not going to get core i5 performance that Intel provides to five to 15 watts in a sub three watt power envelope. Now the ability to emulate x86 apps on an ARM architecture is certainly impressive, but the Celeron N3450, one of Intel's slowest x86 processors, is significantly faster in most x86 workloads, while the low power Core i7 7Y75 obliterates it. And apps just feel sluggish to use, which isn't what you'd expect or what you'd want from a premium tablet. And on top of all this, you're faced with many limitations. The Snapdragon 835 can't run 64-bit apps. It doesn't support x86 drivers, and it doesn't support OpenGL newer than 1.1. And apps that customize Windows may not even work. It's still very early days for the x86 emulation on ARM, so we really need to take a wait-and-see approach. But so far, out of the gate, things are rather limited. But if you're hell-bent on using this device, I'd rather stick to the Windows Store UWP apps for decent enough native performance, I think you'll be fine. And that's good for about a handful of you users out there that like to use Edge as a browser or watching videos, and you're fine with other basic apps and games. But if you're going to use Chrome, and that's something I do, or you want to use apps such as Adobe Photoshop or anything really built for Windows desktops, emulated x86 performance isn't going to really cut it. Especially when there are so many productivity tablets out there that use Intel processors that run x86 apps just fine. The NVX2 storage performance isn't particularly great either. The SATA SSD isn't going to break any speed records, that's for sure. And while that's fine considering the rest of the device's performance, something a bit faster would have been better, even though the performance, again, is disappointing on this tablet. So to bring it all home, I'm gonna give the HP NVX2 a 75%. Unfortunately, its great battery life is outweighed by its lackluster performance. So what do you think about the HP NVX2? I have mixed feelings on it. On the one hand, for the Road Warrior, this is perfect. You got your excellent battery life. It's phenomenal battery life, in fact. You're looking at built-in LTE, really excellent. 
excellent efficiency, great connected standby time. I'm overall looking at it as a productivity machine, great for Microsoft Office, great for sending out emails, surfing the web, watching Netflix, YouTube, that's fine. But things start to fall apart when you try to do too much with this machine. It just can't handle it. It's running in an emulation mode. So when you get x86 apps, some of them work well, some of them don't. Forget about 64-bit apps right now. Supposedly support will be coming down the road via software updates from Microsoft. But right now, forget about the 64-bit app. Now, as far as performance, it didn't do well. As you can see from those benchmarks and from the overall performance, you're not looking at doing any AAA gaming on this, so you can forget about that. Any video editing, I would forget about. This is not that kind of machine. But if you're in the market for a productivity machine that has excellent battery life, built-in LTE, connected standby, always on, like your smartphone, this may be your ticket. I think there's a lot of potential here. I just don't think it's ready right now for the mass audiences. But for the road warrior, this is something to pique your interest. But again, this is early stages and I'm thinking it's just not ready yet. But down the road, there is potential for this to become something of a viable option. Now, I'm curious to see when prices do fall. Right now, it's a very expensive proposition at $999. Now, the Asus Nova Go comes in, I think, at $699, which is a little bit more palatable. But as far as $999 for the HP NVX2, it's, it's a little too expensive. Although the build quality is excellent, it's sleek looking, the display is excellent. I'm really not disappointed in any of those areas. I thought the audio was decent. Decent. I thought everything over, other than performance checked all the boxes. But again, if you're looking for a performance two-in-one, get the Surface Pro, get some of the other competitors out there. I'd wait to see the Intel processor version of the NVX2 before you make a decision. That's going to run a more traditional processor and gives you better performance. I'm pretty sure of that. But I'm curious to know what you think. Leave a comment in the comment section below. I had high hopes for this. Uh, I was curious and I'm glad I got the chance to use it for the past three weeks as my daily driver. The bottom line is it didn't work for me as far as using it as my daily driver. As a secondary travel device, this thing is really interesting. It's got that excellent battery life, like I said, and that built-in LTE really comes in handy a lot more than I thought it would come in handy. So please hit the like button, please subscribe, please share this video. Don't forget to leave a comment in that comment section below. Let me know how I'm doing. Let me know if there's a device or something out there you think I should review. I'll do my best to try to make that happen. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, and of course our website, amdtechreviews.com. So until next time, this is Andrew from AMD Tech. See ya.